If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Did you know there's a way that people can earn unlimited money per year tax-free? Welcome back, investor, to another episode of the Passive Income Adventures. I'm your host, Emma Powell. We retired before age 50 on our passive income from real estate investing. And now we run a, an investing fund for accredited investors to teach you how to do the same so that you can reach financial freedom and design your own retirement. My retirement looks like running a real estate fund. <laughs> Today's guest, we have Jay Connor, who's in a similar position with real estate investing and going off and achieving financial freedom and then finding a calling, teaching other people how to do the same. So thanks for coming on the show today, Jay. Emma, thank you so much for inviting me to come along and talk about what I'm so passionate about, that being private money. And I'm so excited about private money because private money's had a bigger impact on mine and my wife's real estate investing career than anything else that we've implemented in our company. I agree. I tell everybody who wants to start a real estate business, if they want to be a passive investor, you have to be the private money, either lender or investor. Or if you want to have a real estate business, eventually you're going to need to raise money from. And I think a lot of people are scared of it. They shy away from it and they think oh, I'll just use all my own money. And I've seen that be successful with people who are extremely high income earning and they can buy all their own properties. But really, if they're extremely high income earning, they don't typically want to run a real estate business on the side. And so we're really dealing with two different groups of people here. Everybody needs to at least provide private money if they want passive income or to be able to raise private money if they want some sort of a, a real estate business. So I really appreciate you coming on and, and shining some light on. That's what really intrigued me because what we do is private money. Like we do hard money loans and we reach out to people who want to be completely passive and are just tired of having rentals or don't really want to buy an apartment building. Give us a little bit about your history, your credibility, how you got to this point, like your past story and the listener, why anybody should listen to Jay Connor about private money. That's a good question. Carol Joy, my wife and I, we started investing full time in single family houses. Now we've done a lot of different types of real estate. I've built a shopping center from the ground up. I've done condominium projects, but our focus ever since three, 2003, has been single family houses here in Eastern North Carolina. Now we're in a very small market on purpose. I decided in 2003, if I can't drive by it within 30 minutes, I'm really not interested in it. That's just my own business decision. But then again, I can't tell you how long it's been since I actually went out and looked at a house. I've got a fantastic team <laughs> that does that for me. But anyway, so we've been full-time for a long time, 2003. We're in a small market, only 40,000 people in our total target market. And we'll do two or three deals a month. But average profits right now are $82,000 per flip, per fix and flip that we do. And I don't say that, Emma, to brag at all. I say that and share that to make a point. And the point is, you don't have to be in some huge populated area in some huge market to be making significant income. I would rather be a big fish in a small pond and dominate the market. So that's what we're doing. From 2003 until January of 2009, all I knew to do was go to the local bank. I never even heard of hard money from 2003 <laughs> to 2000. I didn't even know what a hard money fund was. All I knew to do was to go to the local bank and have my line of credit there. And I'd get on my hands and knees and put my hands underneath my chin and raise my skirt up so they can look at my personal assets and my financial statement and my credit score. They made all the rules. They did all the underwriting. That's the traditional way to borrow money. And so that's what I did until January, 2009. What happened in January, 2009? I had two houses under contract that represented over $100,000 in profit. And so I called up Steve. Steve was my banker at the local bank that I've been doing business with for six years. And I called him up to tell him about these two deals. And Steve and I had had this kind of conversation many times for six years. And I learned like that at the snap of a finger 
that my line of credit had been closed. Steve yeah. said, Jay, I'm sorry, but your line of credit's closed. We're not loaning money out to real estate investors anymore right now. I said, Steve, what in the world are you talking about? Why have you closed my line of credit? We got a great relationship for six years. We've done a lot of deals. I got a great credit score. What's the deal? He said, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now? I said, no, but you just gave me a global financial crisis yeah. because I don't have a way to fund my two deals that I've got under contract. And back then, you couldn't get your earnest money back when you put earnest money down. So anyway, I hung up my phone. Emma, I'm going to share with you and your audience right now a very powerful question, and the power is in the questions. I'm, I'm going to share a very powerful question that I ask myself sitting right here at this desk when I hung up the phone with Steve. I said, Jay, who do you know? And by the way, this question will help fix any problem anybody's got. Career, financial, relationships, health, it don't matter. The question I asked myself was, Jay, who do you know that can help you with your problem? And by the way, people running around saying every problem's an opportunity. I want to throw up. I didn't have an opportunity. I had a problem, right? So who do I know that can help me with my problem? When I asked myself that question, I immediately thought of Jeff Blankenship, good friend of ours. He was living in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time. And he was a real estate investor. So I called up Jeff and told him what had just happened. He said, Jay, welcome to the club. I said, what club is that? He said, the club of having your line of credit shut down. He said, my yes. bank shut me down last week. I said, how are you going to fund your deals? He said, have you ever heard of private money? I said, no. He said, have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs and how individuals can use their own retirement accounts to be a passive investor and be a private lender using retirement money. I said, no, I never heard of that. So I hung up the phone with Jeff and I started researching and studying what in the world this private money thing is and how to find them and how to start conversations and et cetera. Well, without running around with my hair on fire, I was able to attract, I didn't do any chasing, begging, selling, persuading. I was able to attract and get $2,150,000 in less than 90 days just through my own connections and my contacts in my cell phone. And what's interesting, Emma, I did it and I still do it this day. I did not ask anybody for money. I got 47 private lenders right now, individuals that are funding our deals and not one of them did I ask for money and I've never pitched a deal. People say, Jay, how do you have all the private money you need? And you never ask anybody and you don't pitch deals. Here's the secret. Yeah. I put on my private lender well, I, teacher, well, my private money teacher hat, and I just start teaching people. That's what I started doing, teaching people what's private money, how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely as a totally a passive investor, how they're protected, how they can get their money back in case of an emergency, and et cetera. And I did it a, a number of various ways. I put on private lender luncheons where I just invite people to lunch. I feed them lunch and I teach them the program. And what's interesting, Emma, desperation's got a smell to it. The worst time to be raising private money is when you need it <laughs> for a deal. And by the way, I'm going to take a little bit of risk right here, Emma. I'm going to take a little risk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that I think is stupid, right? And I've heard it said on stage many times, and you probably have too by other gurus and real estate investing educators, but they'll say, oh, just get the deal under contract. Yeah. The money will show up. You ever heard that? Oh, they say it a lot. It's a way to get people to buy their expensive program. Just exactly. Buy the money will show up. Yeah, it's, like, it's so stupid. It's like, where's the money going to come from? Is it just going to like rain out of clouds or something? So that's why I practice and preach, get the money lined up. There's always going to be deals get the money lined up, and then you can have, think about how much more confident and how many more offers they're going to make if they got the money lined up or a relationship, say, with a hard money lender. But anyway, so how do I get deals funded without pitching deals? Here's the secret. We separate the conversation of teaching the program. The new private lender says, okay, I got X number of dollars I want to start with. 
when you get a deal or I've got retirement funds, I'm not happy with those returns. I'll introduce them to myself to the IRA representative, get their funds moved over. And then when I got a deal for them to, to fund, I give them what's called the good news phone call. I'm not calling them to pitch a deal. Of course, they want to fund the deal because they're waiting for the phone call, particularly if they move the money over to a self-directed IRA company, they're not earning any money until mm -hmm. they put that money to work. So here's the script, and then I'll turn it back to you, Emma. Here's the script of exactly what I say when I've got, them, got a deal from the fund. I'll call them up. We'll have a little bit of chit-chat, and I'll say, I got great news. I can now put your money to work. I've got a house under contract right now in Newport when the after repaired value is $200,000. The funding required for the deal is $150,000. So that matches up to what you told me you've got. And closing is going to be next Tuesday. So you'll need to have your funds wired to my real estate attorney's trust account by next Monday. I'm going to email you the wiring instructions. End of conversation. The most stupid thing I could do is ask them, do you want to fund the deal? Of course. <laughs> of course they want to fund the deal. They've been waiting for me to call them up and put their money to work, particularly if they've moved retirement funds over mm -hmm. to a self-directed IRA company at my recommendation. They're not making any money until I put it to work. And of course, I'm not going to bring a deal for them to fund unless it matches the criteria of the program that I already taught them, maximum loan to value, et cetera. And so that's it. Separating the conversations of teaching and then having deals for them to fund. And it's an amazing concept because I love to teach. I just teach people for free, pours out of me. My kids wish I would stop trying to teach them so much. And looking for somebody who really does enjoy teaching has a way of building trust. And people can tell if somebody's teaching for an ulterior motive or teaching for just the love of teaching. But you've been able to combine those two approaches. Can you tell us a little bit more about the nitty gritty or the technical part of combining that? Because like I said, it's very important to be authentic and genuine and really love teaching, but at the same time, make it clear. And when I have an opportunity, you can fund it. And in fact, when I'm sharing how the program works and how they're protected and et cetera, I let them know up front. I'll say, I don't have anything today for you, but let's go over the program and see if it makes sense to you. And I'll tell you, I have hardly had anybody engage in a conversation with me about exactly how the program works and the kind of rates that they can get on their returns and stuff, unless they're, they've got money or investment capital yeah. or, or, or retirement funds. They're not interested in how that works. And I love how uh, you can start conversations. I love what I call, did you know questions? I love did questions. And I can be in a conversation with anybody. And just in the conversation, I'll just say, by the way, did you know there's a way that people can earn unlimited money per year tax free? They're not going to know the answer to that question. Of course, I'm talking about having a Roth IRA, which is established with after tax money, and then they can invest that or loan it out and there's no taxes to be paid on those returns. And so I'll say, did you know there's a way people can earn unlimited money per year tax-free? And they'll say no. And I'll say, my follow-up question to that is I'll say, have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs? In all probability, they haven't. So now we can have a conversation about retirement funds yeah. and, and go down that route. I'll share a short story, Emma. I'll share the short story of how I got my very first private lender at $500,000, mind you, without asking for money. So it was on a Wednesday evening. Carol Joy and I are very involved in uh, the local church here in Moorhead City. And so we were at Bible study on Wednesday night. I know I wanted to speak with Wayne, was his name. And so I walked into the foyer. I walked up to him and I said, Wayne, I said, could we visit confidentially for a few minutes when we finish church? And he said, of course. So the short version is we got together down in the nursery. I shut the door. Here's exactly, Emma, what I said to Wayne. I said, Wayne, everybody in this town, and he did, he's passed away now, I said, but he did. I said, Wayne was the original Zenith television dealer. Now, if you don't know what the Zenith television dealer was, then you are <laughs> too young to remember life before Walmart came to town. So anyway, he was the Zenith television dealer and I, and he was plugged into the, I said, Wayne, everybody. 
you're plugged into the Rotary Club. I said, and here's the magic phrase. I said, Wayne, I need your help. I said, I've now opened up my real estate investing business by referral only, and I'm paying investors that want to invest with me insane high rates of return. So here's what I need your help with, Wayne. When you run across somebody that's complaining about the low interest rates they can get on a certificate or deposit at the bank or the losing money in the stock market, would you refer them to me and I'll tell them about my program? What do you think Wayne said? He said, well, now, Jay, what you got going on? And I said, well, are you saying that you and your wife might be interested? He said, we might be. I said, why is that? He said, we're only earning 3% in the local bank. And that's what it was back in 2009. Only earning 3% in the local bank and we're losing money uh, in the stock market. He said, what kind of interest rate are you paying? I said, that depends on the deal. I said, Wayne, what sounds high to you? He said, I don't know, maybe 5% or 6%. I said, Wayne, I can't pay you 5% or 6%, but I can pay you 8%. He said, put me down for $250,000. So the very next day, I went to his and his wife's home, and we had a conversation over coffee, and I put on my teacher hat, right? Yeah. (laughs) And I taught him my program, the, the rates I pay. We talked about how often they would want payments. Remember, there's no deal involved in this conversation, this initial conversation. And I let them know, I put a 90-day call option in the note that if you got an emergency, you need your money back early, you can get your money back early, real easy to do business with. That $250,000 by the end of the conversation became $500,000. Let's unpack that story. By the way, so I called him up in less than a week with the good news phone call that I just shared. So let's unpack how that happened and what happened. First of all, did you notice I didn't ask him for any money? I asked him for his help to just spread the word as to what I got going on. And people, generally speaking, want to help, right? So spread the word. Now, why did that pledge of money come across so quickly? Because the relationship was already in place, obviously. Mm -hmm. The level of trust was already there. Even though I'm protecting them, I'm not borrowing unsecured money, but that trust relationship was in there. By the way, Wayne and his wife did help out a lot. They spread the word big time and got countless referrals from other new people that didn't know about private money and how the program worked. So that is, that's an example of attracting the money without chasing or begging or trying to talk anybody into anything. Yeah. And I'm reminded of the first time somebody approached me to be a private money lender. It was a friend of ours, we're best friends and very great relationship of trust. He came from a real estate investing family. Like his uncle literally wrote the book on private money. (laughs) But for whatever reason, that education didn't happen. We were sitting there with somebody we really trusted who was offering us 10%, which to me at the time sounded too high, like scammy high. And the deal was already there and he already needed the money from the deal. And you could tell because we knew him so well that there was almost this trembling that he had already gotten himself into a situation like what you mentioned with your banker that he was trying to get himself out of. And the difference in the way he spoke and his body language and all of that was just making us feel like I wanted to help him because I knew that our friend was already in the deal and needed the money, but I didn't feel prepared. I didn't feel educated. It was the first time it had ever come up and suddenly we're supposed to be wiring money. And we had been working to save up this hundred grand for a while. And we had no business putting a hundred grand into one deal, right? That was the only hundred grand that we had. So I think that we were probably a bad target from the beginning. And I use the word target, not in a derogatory way, but we were just a bad candidate from the beginning because we only had $100,000. not to put that all in, in basically one house, one flip. But because we talked about flipping real estate and because it, it, it come up a couple of times, I think that was where the conversation was and it didn't work. And I repeated the same mistake. One of the first times I asked somebody for private money, she actually reached out to me on social media because you're doing this before social media, right? And oh, she yeah. reached out to me on social media from a group that we were in, a Facebook group. And I explained it to her. I'm not going to make the same mistake. And then when I did get a deal, I called her and I was very excited. And I said, hey, there's a deal. We need to move. And she said, wait a second. Like, I haven't even talked to my husband about this. I didn't really, this is moving fast. I said, we talked about this. It, it moves fast. Once you find the deal, you need to move. And I guess I had not done a good job of preparing her what that 
next step process. So I failed in the teaching as well because she reached out to me. I thought she was ready. I didn't educate enough and she wasn't ready. And so these are some of the classic mistakes that I'm hearing I'm making, our friends are making, and that you somehow seem to avoid making because the first person he had this conversation with actually did fund your deal. And what you did in the middle was just getting together with the spouse, sitting out, doing the education before a deal ever came along. Uh, from the story that I just told you or the stories I just told you, are you, what's the missing piece there? Why didn't it work? Is it because the education was missing or you seen some other things there that could have worked differently in those two situations? Yeah. The first story of your friend wanting to borrow money, you felt and you smelled his desperation. And when you sense somebody's desperate, it makes you run. It makes you run, right? They're scared. We attract what we attract the same emotions that we are putting out. And if that person that is having a deal that to be funded, as I said a minute ago, the worst time to be raising money is when you need it for a deal. So that desperation, uh, you know, oozed out kind of thing. Now, the other story you just shared about your friend that had reached out to you, had she told you the exact amount of money that she had that she wanted to invest. Yes. All right. All right. So that's good. We just didn't have some open-ended unknown checkbook. Um, yeah. And so she had told you an exact amount. How much time went by approximately from when she reached out to you, she told you how much she had, and then you had a deal for her to fund? Of weeks. Because when she did reach out to me, I didn't have anything at the time. And then I found a flip a couple of weeks later, maybe a month tops, gotcha. but maybe I hadn't called her in between to let her know I was looking. I don't know. I definitely messed well, no, up. That, no, no the, the, time, the time frame doesn't bother me, given my experience. To what degree, oh my land, is this my podcast or your podcast? <laughs> to what degree, <laughs> to what degree did you tell her the details of your program when she reached out to you? Did you tell her the interest rate that you pay? Yeah, I guess I thought I did a good job teaching, but. Right. So you tell her, did you tell her the maximum loan to value, for example? I think she was doing down payment money. So I was getting a hard money loan to close it. And then she was going to come in as a down. Oh, payment. she was doing the difference. The only thing that comes to my mind is that you were taking the pledge from what I call a one-legged duck. Yeah. So she was not the only decision maker. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when she said, oh, I haven't talked to my husband, I haven't even talked to my husband about this. Obviously, he was going to be in part of the decision. So I'm glad you shared this story, Emma, because here is a big takeaway from your story. When you are presenting the opportunity to be a private lender, you want to have that conversation with all the decision makers up front instead of just one party. So if yep. you've got spouses involved or you got business partners or whatever, you want both, you want all parties to be hearing about your program and how your opportunity works. And then there's no, oh, I haven't talked to Sewing. So yeah. I and I it's so many things that so many factors. This is why I really wanted to talk to you because the selfishness of hosting a podcast and getting somebody to myself <laughs> for a little while and asking all the questions that either I want to ask because my current self needs to know that or recognizing that the conversation has value for my past experiences to the listener who may be going through this. So let's shift gears a little bit to the kind of person who is going to be the private money lender to the kind of person who is going to be asking for the private money because we have both types of listeners on this show. People who have already are making a great income, like your friend, he had some cash, and he just was like, I have enough money now that if I get really started investing it and add to the pile as I work over the next, say, 10 years, um, that I can get $2 million rolling in play and I can earn, say, 10% income mm -hmm. off of that uh, annually through private lending. And that would make me basically 200 grand worth of income after taxes. You do have to pay tax on interest income. But if you do it through your IRA, that's already tax advantage. And that's one thing I always I like to make sure that people understand. And then the other type of person who doesn't have enough money from their high paying job that over the course of the next 10 years, they can't get $2 million in play where they can retire earlier, hit financial freedom. And they're like, I need to figure out how to make more money. And so you have somebody who's maybe going to be starting a business or starting a real estate business to earn more money 
trading time for money. That's not passive, right? But then you have people who are like, I already have a job. I don't need a, a side hustle, right? So let's talk about those two avatars, the two ends of the transaction. What kind sure. of person is it? And describe that so our listeners can identify which one uh, they are most likely to be. So let's talk about the, from the perspective of a private lender mm -hmm. that is going to be loaning the money out to the real estate investor. So what are the things to look for and be aware of? First of all, if you are interested in being a private lender to be a passive investor, the first question is, how well do you know the person that's the operator that's going to be borrowing the money? At the end of the day, really, private lenders are not investing in the deal. They're really not investing in the deal. They're really investing in you, the operator, is who they're investing in. So, you know, what kind of reputation do you have? How well do you know them? Now, I've got a lot of private lenders that I've not even met in person. It's all been over the phone or on Zoom because they were referred to me by a current private lender. That's what we call the trust bridge, mm -hmm. that trust that already exists between me and existing private lender. Then that trust bridge is then carried over to whoever they are referring to me to be a, another private lender. So first of all, how well do you know them? Secondly, how much experience do they have? Now. One common question I get from new real estate investors is, who's going to loan me money and I've never done a deal? And the answer is probably nobody unless you are joining hips with a business partner that's already done a lot of deals. And yeah. so you can leverage the experience of your business partner. That's why so many of my students and my coaching members leverage the relationship with me because we're in business together. And they get to leverage my experience of rehabbing over 500 houses and being in this full time since 2013. So back to the question, what should a new private lender watch out for? The operator, what kind of experience do they have or their business partner? And then the next thing to watch out for is how are you or your money protected? So here's a writer downer. Don't ever loan out unsecured money. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care how well you know your brother, your sister, your mother, or your daddy, right? Everybody needs to be protected. So for example, how do I protect my private lenders? Multiple ways. First of all, we're going to collateralize their promissory note by a mortgage here in North Carolina. It's a deed of trust. So we're going to collateralize that note and back that note by the real estate that's being purchased. So it is secured. In other words, if the borrower doesn't pay you, then the real estate does. If they don't yep. pay, you get the property, right? No. Yep. Next point, how conservative is the loan to value? Now, I borrow against after repaired value because most properties I'm doing renovations. So I'll be borrowing up to 75% of the after repaired value. So there's going to be a 25% cushion for the private lender. So you want to make sure the property is not over leveraged by your money that you're loaning out, right? So you want to conserve your loan to value. How else should you be protected? You should be protected as a private lender by requiring to be named on the insurance policy, that property insurance policy, as the mortgagee. If we borrow money from the bank, I promise you the bank is going to be named as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. What does that accomplish? Here's what that accomplishes. <laughs> if there's ever a claim, a property insurance claim against that property, the insurance company is going to make the check payable to you, the borrower, your entity, and to the mortgagees, to the lenders. They've got to sign off on that check before you get the money. That's another layer of protection for the lender. Also going to name the lender as uh, an additional insured on the title policy. So in case there's any title issues down the road, then they're protected as well. And so and how else are you protected? Don't you ever give money directly to the borrower. You want your money. <laughs> Look, and that's what a lot of private, one of my first private lenders, or more than one, they said, Jay, I, I like the program. I'm ready to start. What do I do? Do I just write you a check? No, yeah. you don't write me a check. When I've got a deal for you to fund that I can collateralize your note, then you're going to wire 
the funds that you're lending directly to my closing agent's trust account. So if you're using a title company, you're using a real estate attorney. We use real estate attorneys here in North Carolina yeah. for, for mortgages. You want to mail it to them. And then after closing, after everybody's protected on public record, then the title company or the real estate attorney will then disperse funds. Yes. And that, that is so much more similar to my first experience being a private lender. We, I, I tell people house hack. If you don't have enough money, like you said, no one's going to lend you a deal if you loan money on a deal if you've never done one before. So you've, you've got to figure out a way to get this done either with like a family member or business partner, like you said, somebody you're really, really close to who's willing to, to bet on you, which is really what it is. But what we had done is we lived in a house, we completely remodeled it. We added a lot of value to it that we lived in it ourselves. And then when we sold that house, we were able to take that cash and learn how to run a real estate business. And the first thing I did was take that cash to somebody and say, can I make you a hard money loan? Like I was one of those easy ones who comes in and says, I, I've thought about this before. I've been approached about it before. I've heard about it a few times. I'm ready to do it. We sold the house. I have the cash in my hand. Let's go. And then while you're keeping that working for six months or something at 10%, sometimes 12%, depending on how much you have invested, then I can go out and learn. So I started attending real estate clubs and networking and he had my money out. But after the initial conversation of, I want to lend you some money where it seemed really easy, then I got real difficult because then I have to say, okay, I want to come to your office. I want to meet you. I want to meet your team. I want you to teach me what you're doing. And he was very patient, educated me, all the things that you mentioned. It's going to go to the trust account. I, we're going to have it leaned against the property, like all of this kind of stuff. Here's the address. Check it out. All because I, I just felt he had told me everything I needed to know, but I freaked out a little bit of buyer's remorse, a little bit of fear, right? It wasn't all the money we had, but it was close to all the money that we had in one deal. And that was probably a mistake. And so one of the things that I tell my private lenders now, in addition to everything that you just mentioned, and you tell me wh what your opinion is of this. I always ask, like, how much money do you have in general? <laughs> What's your net worth? I have to ask them if they're an accredited investor because our fund is for accredited only, right? But at the same time, I'm like, is this the only $300,000 that you have to your name other than your salary? Um, and if the answer is yes, I don't want it. I'll take 50, right? But then you need to figure out how to go get more or diversify. You can put it in lots of other things, but I don't want such a huge chunk of your net worth. and making sure that they don't make the same mistake I did because I invested so much of my net worth in one deal. I got very nervous and very scared over the following months because it was a big flip and it took a long time. And so that was one error that I made. I don't think he made that error, but he never did ask, like, how much money do you have? What is your net worth? Are you qualified to be putting this much money in one deal? And for me, that's now very important. Diversification is, is huge. So how do you, how do you counsel your private lenders not being a financial advisor? How do you say, look, the loan to value on the property should only be 70, 75%. But what about portion of their net worth? How do you have that conversation about their personal finances? I have a very general conversation. I don't ask them specifically, what's your net worth? I don't ask them how much reserve you've got. I'm not comfortable asking that because it's really none of my business. Yeah. However, I do advise them. The sentence I say is, don't give me all your money. I say, look, I want you to keep enough in reserves that you're going to be able to live comfortably for the next year in your reserves if you have zero income coming in, right? Can you live comfortably for the next year and you don't have to tap into anything? So another thing I'll say is I want you to have plenty of liquidity over on the side for any kind of rainy day that comes up. I'll say, even though I'm giving you a 90 day call option in the promissory note, and you can get your money back in case you have an emergency, and it probably is only going to take me two weeks to, to replace it, but it is 90 days. So mm -hmm. in other words, just don't put yourself in a corner. Yeah. One thing that makes it easier for me is I need to at least know their minimum net worth that it qualified to right. be an accredited investor. But the other question that makes it easy without prying too much into their finances is something more along the lines of what are your uh, expenses that you're going to need to be covering? What would you do if you lost all this money? People are afraid to ask that question because they're afraid that then now you're putting the idea of loss into their mind and then they get cold feet and then they might not invest. But to me, it's almost like a test to say, how cold are their feet? 
uh, how nervous of a lender are they going to be? What would you do if the worst case happened and we lost this money? Tell me about that. Thank and finding that conversation gives me a lot of information about them. And Dirk, because well, I don't like nervous money. Sure. Because of your own personal experience, it's very natural for you to have that kind of conversation because I'm sure that when you have that kind of conversation, you're probably sharing your own personal experience as to why you're going down that road of conversation. So it makes sense for you to have that kind of conversation, particularly since you're raising money for a fund and they've got to be an accredited investor. Yeah. And that makes sense too. And those personal experiences, sometimes they surprise me. I asked somebody recently, I always say, oh, we that's our next steps are whatever. Let's get on a phone conversation with your husband or with your wife. And I was talking to somebody and they said, oh, no, we do our own investing. He's got his thing. I've got my thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, that can happen. Because normally it's, oh, I haven't talked to my husband yet. Or I need to talk to my wife or my pastor, or my brother-in-law, or my financial advisor, whoever it is. So normally I say things like, what's your normal decision-making process that you go through before making these decisions? Who needs to be involved? Like sometimes they say, I need to pray about it or I need to talk to my pastor. It doesn't matter what it is. I just need to know what it is to make sure that if they need to talk to me, ask me any questions, that I'm aware of what their next steps are. Because I tend not to do like the one call close, especially with a lot of people who reach out to me are complete strangers, right? And so I need to build up a relationship and make sure they go through their regular decision-making process. But I guess with you, when you first started, people knew you really well. Sure. Now you're having referrals of people who you said there's a trust bridge, but you still need to go through a process. How many conversations or what period of time? I know everybody's different, but what do you normally plan on to say, like, before you call them and say, hey, I have a deal? Is it different with everybody, depending on their process? It's either, quite frankly, it's one or two at the most. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Typically, no more than yeah. two. Because by the time I have a conversation with them and mm -hmm. go into the detail of, the program and the return they get and how they're protected and all that stuff that we're talking about, they've already shown interest. They've mm -hmm. already shown interest or, they, or they've heard about it. Yeah. From somebody. In fact, by the time I have a referral to me and they want to talk with me, they already know the program because yeah. whoever it is that referred them to me already spilled the beans yep. and told them the kind of interest rate they're getting and, and, the layers of protection. So they pretty much are, by the time I talk to a referral, they're like pretty much ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Like me, when I walked up to the guy at the club and said, everybody said, you're the guy to talk to for private money lending. What projects do you have? <laughs> you know, he was just like, okay. But when you put that out there and he had made a reputation for himself that way, I, I was pretty ready to go ahead and make the leap even after his first, maybe second conversation. Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing that you're talking about, those trust bridges are very important. And one thing I've noticed with real estate investors when they first start and you say, what sounds high to you? Oh, 5% sounds high. And you're like, well, it's 8, 10 or 12% that I'm paying. It's so high that they feel like it's scammy high. But then once they get into the world a little bit and they realize all oh, these pretty typical returns for hard money loans, then I feel like they start getting shiny things in their eyes about equity and equity deals and syndications and things are going to be paying out 15, 18, 20 plus percent, depending on what the asset is. And a lot of people are like, oh man, I, I can perform so much better with the equity or can I be a down payment partner instead of on the lean end, like a equity partner. So we do offer equity in our fund, but I've noticed that this is a big fight between people where they're like, there's that sure money, that 10 or 12% total equities over there sparkly that I heard about somebody at a, at a real estate club. I personally do both, but I only do as much equity as I need for the tax depreciation. And the rest of it, mm -hmm. Is cash flow through lending. And so making those decisions and being able to diversify. So I often find myself really struggling with people who are over invested in equity and don't have enough private debt in their books. And so what kinds of opportunities either do you offer or do you yourself invest in that are more on the equity side, either for higher returns or for the tax depreciation? So I've never offered any equity mm -hmm. in any of my deals. It's always been straight interest rates. And as far as investing goes, I pretty much just stick in my own little wheelhouse, which is single family houses here in Eastern North Carolina. And I get the question all the time. I say, Jay, don't you want to expand out? Don't you want to grow? Yeah. Don't you want to go, in, go to some other areas? I say, no, I'm, yeah. I'm two to three deals a month, $82,000 net after realtor fees. That's good. And that's good enough for me. 
But where I'm spending so much of my time is in my coaching, working with real estate investors to help them grow their business, to help them raise private money. And that's just what I absolutely love. I just love having my teacher hat on and sharing with other people how we do this thing. Yeah. And for me, I've just realized over the years is I want more boring investments. The boring are the better because once you have <laughs> enough cash that you've built up, that it can be compounding at, say, that average rate of, say, just 10 percent, right? Just because it makes the math easier. I know I can go out and get 10 percent any day of the week. So I basically do my own investing portfolio calculations based on an average rate of return of 10 percent. And if occasionally I do an equity deal for tax depreciation that hits a home run and it performs at that 15, 18, 20 percent or maybe even better, look, the economy was good. Bulls days are coming back. Don't worry. I feel like the more money you have, the less money you can earn on it and still be doing really well. And the less money you earn typically are the more boring investments. That's why they're and, and it's so funny that when you start talking to your private lenders and you tell them 10%, they're like, wow, that's high, scammy high. But after a while, they're like, yeah, 10%, that's not that much compared to, to what they can be doing. So we do, like I said, occasionally offer equity investments because I need some, our investors need some. For the most part, I am just all in on the hard money side because it's just so straightforward, simple, easy to find, easy to make a great 10, maybe 12% return. And just I, a lot of investors just, are not even thinking that they need to have this as part of the, their portfolio, at least a percentage. So given that, what, what do you typically have your people doing? Just give us an, an eye into the wealthy people that you're dealing with. How much of their portfolio do they typically have allocated towards this particular asset class? I really don't know. Yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> they didn't tell me. I just said, keep enough in reserves. And all of my private lenders, all 47 of them, they're just regular people. Here's what's yeah. funny, Emma. You're going to find this funny. I'm pretty sure not one of my 47 private lenders even knows what an accredited investor is. They don't even, oh, they don't even know. Yeah. But not one of these people had ever heard of private money. They didn't know what yeah. it was until I taught them about it. And they're everyday walk of life people, right. school teachers that are still teaching. I've got a couple, both of them retired school teachers. They got $1,250,000 with me. Who would think that retired school teachers <laughs> would have a million two hundred? But look, they've been saving up money in their retirement plans for all them years and never touched it, right? Yep. So there it is. And I've even had minor children less than 18 years old as private lenders. Of course, they can't sign legal documents because they weren't 18. So their parents had to do the signing for them. But they inherited money from grandparents. The parents advised them, hey, you need to put your money with Jay because you're going to mm -hmm. get that good rate of return, et cetera. So it's just people from all walks of life, people that I've met through church affiliation, civic club organizations. Being, I have gotten a lot of private money over the years from being active in business networking international. Yeah. Some people say, Jay, all my people are broke. I don't know anybody with money. You need to go, the more money you waller in, the more money sticks to you. So yeah. go where the money is. I coach other real estate investors that want to expand their network quickly. Get involved in Business Networking International, your local chapter, because now you're going to have 20 or 30 other individuals referring people to you that you're looking for. And of course, you're going to be referring leads to them as well. So there, here's the thing. There's more money out there available than there are deals. I promise yeah. you. There's more money than there is deals. So get the money lined up first. Yeah. Well, and such a good point. And I love that you brought it up because so many people will say, I don't know any rich people. Where do I go to find them? Do I have to fly first class? Do I have to join a country club? I'm like, those are good options. Get an expensive hobby. Take up scuba diving or, or motocross or something. Whatever you mm -hmm. enjoy. I, I did this once where I invested in a sports team. And I got to sit in the owner's box and enjoy the game from there. And I noticed when I would bring potential investors with me to the game, I'm like, shh, watching the game, right? So just make sure that it's a hobby that you can actually network and, and participate in the conversation with. So I had to just go to the games by myself and then get another one. I got an invitation just in my inbox in LinkedIn all the time. Hey, I'm speaking at an upcoming conference in your area. Would you like to come? I can get you free tickets. And it's a conference for, say, founders, CEOs sales executives. And I just show up at these conferences 
because people invited me and they're just downtown. Like I just go downtown. Even when we were traveling full time, I was in Florida. Somebody reached out to me on social media. She said, hey, I see that you're in Florida right now. I have tickets to a conference for free. Do you want them? And I showed up and met a bunch of people and found some private lenders there. You have to go where there are opportunities, but people just don't even think about it. BNI is a great one. You've got business leaders there who are really interested in getting referrals, giving you referrals. Uh, what are some of the other best places that, that you go to? For me, it's conferences, local stuff, real estate clubs, big time, because they all love real estate. And a lot of them have cash because they just sold a house or something like that. BNI, what other places do you recommend to your students to say, Here, go find some money at these kinds of places? A great place to go where there is a lot of money and they are wanting to loan money out to real estate investors. They're wanting to loan it out on real estate and be passive. And that is at self-directed IRA conferences uh -huh. and networking events, right? Yes. Over 70% of account holders at, at self-directed IRA companies want to loan. They want to be a passive investor yes. on real estate. However, when you go to those type of events, you are not going to be putting on your teacher hat. They already know what private money yes. is, yes. right? They've already got retirement funds that they want to invest. So this is not going to be a teaching conversation. This is going to be a negotiation mm -hmm. conversation because in my world of private money, where I'm borrowing all my private money from people that I have taught what private money is and told them my program, then I get to make the rules. I yeah. set the interest rate. I set the loan to value. It's my program. But when you're negotiating or borrowing from a hard money lender or et cetera, then they are making the rules. And now you're having a negotiation conversation. However, in answer to your question, there's a lot of money available at those networking events. Do you find those to be so competitive because there's so many other people there to raise capital from that it's not sometimes not worth going? Because there's it's a the, like you were talking about the ponds, a big guy in the small pond or a little guy in a big pond. When you show up to an event like that, uh, everybody's looking for opportunities, but then everybody's flowing in. So you're not the only real estate guy in the room at, at an event like that. Well, that's why I've never done it. Ah. <laughs> now, I've, I've been a guest speaker yes. at a lot of self-directed IRA conferences. In fact, I was mm -hmm. just out in Dallas, Fort Worth and spoke at a huge conference out there a few weeks ago. So I much rather be the teacher and, okay. put, and, and offer the opportunity instead of negotiating and asking and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I very first started out and I had that same question, who wants to lend money to me? I've, the only thing I've ever done is lend money to somebody else in the house hack my own house. And so I thought I need to start putting out some content, writing something, engaging people in conversation somehow. And I said, I don't really know how to write about real estate or how to talk to people about real estate because I don't know what I'm doing back in the day. And I said that, that question is, what could you speak on for 45 minutes if speaker didn't show up and you suddenly needed to go up on stage uh, without any preparation. And I was like, homeschooling as a small business owner. And so I just started writing articles on homeschooling and how you could be an on balancing entrepreneurship and homeschooling. And to me, I was able to slip real estate into there. Like, here's the rental house we just bought, or here's the thing that we just did. So just thinking like, what do I already like? What sports, what hobbies am I already into? What am I already an expert at? And how can I start to bridge that like it's, it's another trust bridge. How can I talk about something I am an expert at and start to bridge that little by little as I get a uh, little experience along the way? So these tips are golden and it's questions that everybody asks, but sometimes having them all in one place during a conversation like this is really valuable. Like you've dropped a lot of good advice and I had a list of questions I wanted to ask you and you hit on all of them. So you've obviously been doing this a long time. You are a great teacher and you obviously really enjoy teaching. So tell us what is next for you? What's down the line? Because this is a show about passive income and the adventures we can go on when we're not tied to a nine to five. You obviously really love what you do. So I imagine you plan on continuing to do it for a number of years. But tell us about like the way that you design your lifestyle. What's important to you? What kinds of decisions go into the, the choices that you make for how you spend your time? Yeah, what I am most passionate about is making an impact. I've reached that age in my life that it's a whole lot more about significance and making an impact than it is exactly what's the dollar figure in the checkbook, right? 
So I know that I can impact so many more lives when I am working with other real estate investors than the impact I'm making one house at a time. Now there's an impact on that. There's the contractors and there's the crews and there's a lot of people that are impacted when you do a house, but I'm able to impact so many more lives in this area of coaching and teaching. So for example, my podcast, I just started my eighth year on my podcast and we've reached thousands and thousands of people every week on the podcast. My podcast, by the way, shockingly, is titled Raising Private Money with Jay <laughs> Connor. It's on all the platforms. But doing that, I really enjoy being a, a podcaster. I'm, I'm interviewing people that have raised private money all the time and interviewing them about how they go about it. So what's next for me is scaling and growing my coaching that I do for real estate investors. I've been coaching other real estate investors ever since 2011. But for example, I'm so passionate about sharing what I know. I just finished recording, Emma, my brand new private money challenge. It's called the seven day private money challenge. And it's a series of seven videos and they're only 15 to 20 minutes long. So they're very digestible, right? Mm -hmm. Gives a great foundation on private money, what it is, how I go about raising it. It's all framed with how to raise all this private money without asking for money that we've been talking about it. And Emma, when somebody enrolls in the private money challenge, they immediately get the first uh, video training in their email inbox. In the next six days at 9 a.m. Eastern, they get each subsequent video training. And if you want me to, I'd love to give out the uh, URL, the website where people can come join the party. Yeah, fire away. How do people get in touch with you? You mentioned your podcast. Go ahead and give them your website so they can jump in there, learn how to raise private money. Or if they want to be a private money lender, how do they get in touch with you? Sure. So the best way is with this brand new private money challenge. So go to www.privatemoneychallenge.com, privatemoneychallenge.com. And I got two promises for you. First of all, You'll get a great foundational uh, education on private money. I even have a session that I teach you how much private money should you raise, right? Because you don't want to raise all that private money and then you're not going to be able to use it. Yeah. So how much should you raise? And the other promise I got for you is you come enroll in the private money challenge. I promise you, you're going to have a lot of fun because I'm going to be right there on the video engaging with you, giving you a little bit of homework to do. Come join the party, privatemoneychallenge.com. Yeah, it's such a great thing you're putting out there because I often, people have never even heard of it. People don't even know that this is out there and are satisfied with lower returns and riskier returns that are even lower. And I feel like, I feel so strongly about it. Like private money has changed our lives from being a private lender to now helping other people be private lenders. We're private lending, well, joint forces. Like basically my money goes out on a deal. I'm like, come join me and the way that we structure it, it changes lives. I went from a stay-at-home mom with a little side hustle business in six years, retiring my husband from his corporate job. And most of that was either facilitated through me being a private lender or doing deals with private money. This is how this industry goes around. And I just feel like more people need to know about it and more people need to have it in their portfolios because it does really have so much power. So thank you for sharing your message with us, Jay. Thank you so much for inviting me to come along. I had a blast and I can't wait to see when this goes out. Yep. I'm I'm super excited about it because this is something I'm so passionate about. Everybody, make sure that you reach out to Jay. If you want to get on a phone call with me, investwithemma.com, just sticks you right to my calendar. Ask whatever questions you have. If I don't know the answer or I don't know uh, how to help you myself, I can direct you to somebody who can help you. And the networking and all of this is why we do this show. Being able to know who to call when you need it. It's like your good news phone call that you mentioned. It's like you need to have a list of people that you can call when you have opportunities or problems arising because you have already created those relationships and that's how the networking works. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Jay. Thank you so much to you, the listener, for coming out. Be sure to go to privatemoneychallenge.com or investwithemma.com. Get in touch with us. Have the conversations. You will be shocked how quickly your life can change by these kinds of tools. So until next time, thank you for listening to the Passive Income Adventures. 
Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.